is a huge honor to be interviewing who I think is a, an amazing pioneer right here in my backyard of Arizona. Um, Mark Costas, you had me, uh, we, we've known each other for a long time. And uh, in, in the world, the reason I wanted to get you on is right now, a lot of dentists are like, oh my God, corporate dentistry. And they're so organized and solo practitioners. It, it's so hard. And dude, I can't think of anybody uh, in my backyard of the state of Arizona that just came into dentistry and was focused on business and systems and organization and team building. And um, I mean, look at you, you're just Mr. Handsome in a suit and tie, Mr. Dapper. I mean, you're crushing it. So my, my, my first question to you, Mark, is, um, is basically just um, how is a solo practitioner going to compete against Heartland Dental, corporate dentistry, um, these big corporate chains who are sophisticated because a, a general dentist has to wear, he's got to learn how to do endo and fillings and crowns and do marketing and, and hire staff and do HR and do team building. How do you do it all? Tell them, tell them about your success, first of all. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that I have an unusual story because I got to learn a little bit about business before I got into dental school. I, uh, it took me three years to get into dental school. I was a 20 time loser trying to get into dental school. <laughs> so three years on the 21st attempt, I got a single acceptance to Marquette University. So 21 attempts, 20 rejections. That left me with a three year span in between undergrad and dental school where I had to figure out what the hell I was going to do. So I started an MBA program. I have not yet to finish because I got accepted halfway through. I got accepted to dental school halfway through. So I, I was halfway through my MBA, could not get a corporate job. Go figure, a psychology major couldn't find, you know, good work in San Diego, California. Um, out of Is that where you're life. from, San Diego? I went to UC San Diego. That's where I did my undergrad. Where were you born and raised? I was born in Poughkeepsie, New York. And then moved all over the place because my dad worked for IBM. As a IBM worker. stands for I've been moved. That's right. <laughs> and we were. I, I probably lived in six or eight different cities uh, before the time I was 15 years old. So we moved around a lot. But in that time when I was getting my MBA, I, I couldn't get a regular job. So I bought a business. I bought a catering truck franchise, believe it or not, a roach coach. In what so, city? In San Diego. Okay. In San Diego. A catering, so, I, I mean, one of those trucks where the, yeah. the good looking girls pull up and make you uh, lunch, sell sandwiches and tacos and, and uh, chips and drink. Yeah, only, only the good looking girl in my case was Mercedes, who was about 55 and she had about four teeth. And she <laughs> was my cook in the back of this thing. And I would drive it from construction site to construction site. I bought a franchise. So I was a franchise holder of this catering truck. And uh, it literally was entrepreneurship 101. So I'm getting my MBA at night and I'm driving a roach coach during the day and, and go figure the roach coach business was what really taught me a lot about, you know, managing overhead, you know, uh, marketing, all that, all the stuff that's really, really important to run a dental office. So I had that benefit. So lucky me, I, it took me three years to get into dental school. So that's, that's a little bit about my background and how I was able to kind of jumpstart into dentistry. And then when I got out, I worked a year as, as an associate there, right there in Phoenix, 32nd and Indian School. And then uh, I, I got out, bought a practice with a, with a partner. That, that partnership dissolved. And then I ended up building seven practices in six years. Wow. So, now, now, how, now, I think of you as Prescott, which uh, to other people listening to this on uh, their podcast uh, is about two hours north. Was about two hours north of Phoenix? Yeah, about 90 miles. Yeah, about 90 miles. So yeah. how, how did how did you leave? Did you just think Phoenix didn't need dentists to overcrowded? So did you go to smaller areas up north, or how how did you get to Prescott? I you figure know, it was funny. love or money. <laughs> it was uh, it was actually opportunity is what it was. I, you know, two thousand two was a good time to be a dentist in Phoenix. Um, you know, down the Chandler area, the Mesa area, out by where you guys were, it was still pretty wide open. So I could have made my way and done multiple practices down there, but a partner and I got together, uh, my ex-roommate from dental school, we found this beat up practice up here in Prescott Valley, decided that we could give it a shot. And, you know, within a year, we brought that thing from 300,000 to a million. And then it, it was a struggle in the beginning, but I, I really kind of fine tuned the systemization of things. Once we figured that out, 
I just I, I looked for areas of opportunity where places were underserved, or if there was a struggling practice, I would acquire it and turn it around. So that that's a bit about the history of that. And now you own seven practices. No, I I'm on my seventh. I've sold four, so I simultaneously will be running three here in about two months. Um, are I they have, all are they all up in rural areas like up by Prescott, or are they all over or in Phoenix? Yeah. We have one in Chino Valley, Arizona. That's my big one. Uh, that that does that's seven operatory practice. That's uh, a, a town of about eleven thousand people. Frank Fred, Frank have, Frank practices up there, doesn't he? Frank Brady. No. Um, there's a I, I I forgot. Anyway, I thought there's a guy named Frank up there. I can't think of it. But Milner. Uh, or, but anyway, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Then I have one in Prescott Valley, and then one's uh, being constructed right now in Prescott. And uh, I'm trying to build. I, I think I think I'll stop at ten. So there's three more down the pipe at some time. Um, so let, so let me ask you this general question. Um, Twenty five. What percent of the uh, dentistry in America today would you say is big corporate chain like a uh, Heartland or um, Pacific Dental or something like Aspen? Uh, what, what what percent? was that when you got out of school what percent is it now and where do you think that's going to be in 10 20 years i would say i would say it's probably currently around 25 30 percent am i am i overestimating do you know well I, you know i i hear it's 15 to 20 you're saying okay. 25 to 30 so i don't think anybody that's what really, it feels like well, in my well, area. It, 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 it's hard to get a definition because when you say corporate dentistry well first of all almost almost 80 percent of all the dentists have, are incorporated Right. So, <clears throat> so then when you say, well, group practice, a third or group practice, um, you know, so then when you say, okay, well, um, group practice, multi-location, you know what I mean? So I guess it really depends on the definition. That's true. I, I'm, some people would consider me corporate because I have more yeah. than two. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, um, but, uh, you know, it was much less. It was much less when I got out in 2002. It's much more now. And I think it's going to be much more in the next 10 years for sure. Um, the writing's on the wall. Uh, but Do you think it'll eventually be like Walgreens? Uh, you know, like Walgreens and CVC will have 90% of the market? I mean, do you think do you think like Heartland or Pacific Dental Services, do you, do you think one of them is like going to be like a Walgreens where they'll have, you know, like 25% of the market or something like that? Or do you not think it'll be not, not that extreme? Sure. I'm sure hoping that it doesn't. I'm, I'm sure hoping it doesn't go commoditization to that level. But uh, I think they have a, a pretty firm grip right now. Um, I think patients are more intelligent than we give them credit for. And a lot of them will fall to the initial bait and switch tactics of the corporate giants and get in there. But then when they see that they have to see a different dentist every single time, and most of them are two days out of dental school, and then six months later, they're gone. Um, I, think, I think that patients want more of a home. Well, up in, in my area, I can't speak for all patients, but up in my area, they want more stability. They want somebody that's rooted in the community. They want somebody that um, has, you know, a track record. Um, and I don't know how it is in the bigger areas where you are. I've had one practice in a bigger area that was Scottsdale. That was the toughest one of all of the one that, ones that I've had. But uh, it, it's a lot different ball game. You know, it's a lot more competitive. And you got to do, you got to do what you got to do to get patients through the door. I, I, I believe with those red flags is at 52, I lived through this before with Orthodontic Centers of America and it doesn't trade on NASDAQ and they all disappeared. And the biggest red flag to me is that, you know, if you're in the dentistry business, rule number one, you're going to have to keep your dentist stable. And right. one, one of those corporate chains, their average dentist isn't even with them a year. So you're, right. you're not going to build a dental empire. I mean, I, I don't imagine Walgreens could be Walgreens if no pharmacist stayed with them longer than a year. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, um, right. yeah so I, I, I believe that, um, and you know, another thing my son Greg uh, pointed out to me, he said, uh, he said, dad, look at the uh, stats for the lawyers because the lawyers, they, they started big corporate chains, you know, long before dentistry did. And right now after their, you know, long run, half the lawyers are still independent lawyers. And the other half are in big chains. And having uh, uh, been doing business my whole life, um, yeah, there's a big difference in a firm where every time you call the accounting firm or the, uh, that, that's why I left my accounting firms because I got tired of dealing with a different accountant every time. And I went and found, you know, somebody that I could just talk to one guy and deal with an accountant. And I, um, yeah, so, so, so I think my son Greg might be right in the fact that um, half of America probably 
is into a commodity. They're only buying price. If their insurance says you have to go to this box to get your tooth fixed, probably will go there. But the other half is probably going to seek out quality, a relationship, stability, someone that knows their teeth, knows their mouth. My last patient yesterday, uh, Ted, um, he came in, he said, uh, he goes, uh, dude, I'm so glad you're working out now because uh, I, I hope you don't die because I don't want anyone else touching my mouth. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, that's good to know. I mean, um, so I tried not to let him know I was chewing on a Twinkie at the time he told me that. I tried to pretend it was a piece of fruit, and uh, but uh, <laughs> disguise, disguise yeah, I disguise it. Yeah, yeah, but those are the types of patients that I want anyway. I want the other fifty percent that you're talking about. I don't want necessarily price shoppers, but sometimes you have to convert the price shoppers to the type of people that we want them to be. You know, um, to to value through our communication skills what we have to offer and to decommoditize you know dentistry. Okay, you're a, you're a uh, you're a natural born leader. You just you're the full package, tall, dark, and handsome leader. I, I've seen you work with your staff. How do you create uh, a dental team? Talk about HR. How do you how do you find attract your amazing team? And, and plus, you're not in Phoenix where you had three million people to pick from. You're you're in Prescott where you probably only had twenty five thousand people to pick from. And how do you hold them accountable and job descriptions? And how how do you do that so well? Because you well, do it well. Thank you. I appreciate that. There's a couple different things. There's recruitment and then there's, you know, getting the best out of each employee. And I think that operational systemization is how you do it. You have to have an airtight protocol manual. Dr. Steve Rasner talks about that a lot. You know, you have to have certain protocol and accountability. And that's all, that all comes down to a single document in your practice. And that's the operations manual. I really believe on spending a, a lot of time developing operations manuals. I talk to dentists all over the country, all over the world, really, and you would be shocked at how many people don't have an operations manual that they ever even look at. And, you know, these are the kinds of people that stomp around the practice because nobody's ever doing it right. But you've really, a lot of those people have never really defined what right is. You know, if you have it in one book and you reference that book every single day, you know, your protocol your accountability agreements, the organizational chart, how things are set up. You have pictures of the ideal setups. You have pictures of what the drawer should look like every single morning. If you have something, a document like that, accountability is really easy. But then you mentioned the word leadership. Leadership is so important also because if you don't hold your team accountable to this book, this operations protocol, then you can't expect them to you know, adhere to the policy of the office. Now, as far as recruitment goes, there's a number of different ways you can do it. Nowadays, everybody's using Craigslist, but it, it is just like any other type of marketing. You want to gather leads first. You're going to have a, a, a funnel, a great number of people that are going to enter the funnel, and then you're going to have different ways to kind of qualify them along the way. So you're going to have five or six different ways to qualify them. You're going to want to maybe have one or two interviews via Skype or on the telephone, one with your operations um, manager, maybe one uh, with the office manager and maybe one with you before they get to even step foot into the office. Once they step foot into the office, they should be interviewed by the team first. If there's no vibe, if there's no gel, if there's no culture fit there, then they get dismissed and, and that's the end of it. You don't have to deal with them. If they pass that test as well, now that that's the fourth step, if they pass that test as well, then they get the working interview and we get to see how they work on their feet, how they interact with, with patients. Everybody gets, everybody on the team gets to put their feedback in on how they feel about this, this particular employee. And then we plug them into uh, the, the practice for a probationary period of usually about 90 days. And we give them the operations manual and say, here are your protocols, here's your, here's your accountability. And if they, if they do well, if they're a culture fit, we keep them. If not, sorry. No, no, I, it, no go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. And I have to say that I have a dental assisting school. I, that's another thing that I do. I sell dental assisting schools to dentists all over the country. We have 135 now. Um, but I constantly have the ability to cherry pick the very best that are in my dental school sessions all the time. So they can have a very, very small amount of clinical experience. But if they're a culture fit, we know that we can work with them. And, and it usually works out great. Everybody on my staff has gone through my dental assisting school program. So, okay, so I want to back up. So this, this, um, this, you call it a manual or office protocol? What did you call it? Operations manual. An operations yeah. manual. Is this something where a dentist listening to this podcast right now, is this something you recommend that they go home and open up a blank um, Word document 
and go through the process of writing this themselves? Or is this something that, I mean, do, could, um, could someone have yours? I mean, do you sell yours? Uh, or is this something you can't really buy someone else's operations manual? It's something you got to go through the process. I usually offer mine up to anybody that wants to look at it, but these things are so customized and particular to each individual practice that there's really a process that everybody needs to go through. Um, and I, you know, I, I have ways that they can contact me about, you know, the process. So, so you, you would email them yours if I'm listening to this podcast right now? Oh, sure. Yeah. I, uh, I, how, how, does, how does a, uh, how does a dentist driving to work right now or on the Stairmaster, how, how would they get a copy of your operations manual? Just email me at info at truedentalsuccess.com and we'll send, we'll send all the PDFs over and they can, they can put it together and they can pick and choose what works and they can customize it. So uh, true dental success, T-R-U-E, dental and success, S-U-C-C-E-S-S. -S. If they email you info at truedentalsuccess.com, you'll email them back a Word document with your operations manual? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, this might be the first time someone's glad they listened to my podcast. <laughs> You're getting a free operation map. So, I mean, how many how many pages is it? Well, it depends. I mean, we we ours is thick. Um, I'm not going to send them every picture that we have, but I have pictures, laminated pictures of every drawer, room one through seven, and those are all slightly different. Uh, we have we have a laminated picture of what the reception area should look like. You know, when we check it every hour, we have a laminated picture of what the panel room, supply room, all those rooms should look like, and then we have protocol sheets for every position at the practice, including the, the office manager. We have accountability agreements, which is basically an employee contract, which says, I, ha I own these four protocol sheets. This protocol sheet called this, 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 and this. I'm responsible for that. I recognize that our core values are this. Our mission statement is this. Our vision statement is this. They sign that. So if we ever have trouble about performance, we can go back and say, look, you signed this document here. And I'm, I'm trying to be a good leader and hold you accountable. You're missing these three things. And then you can counsel them based on something that's in black and white instead of this nebulous thing that I, I think I remember a doctor telling me that I, I should do it this way. You know, it's, it's in black and white. Everybody knows what they should be doing. Will you, will you email me that? The, the complete yeah, sure. one with photos? To, I, I'm Howard at dentaltown.com. I got your email. Yeah. Yeah, will, will you email me the whole thing? I, I, I would I would love to say it. So so I'm going to play devil's advocate. I'm not asking this from my heart. I'm, I tried to guess. Um, like I say, when we had put up our 75th podcast, we passed 100,000 views. So it's tough when you're the interviewer because you got kids that are junior in dental school all the way to people that just are trying to sell their practice and, and go home and retire. What, what if you're driving to work and thinking, dude, that's anal. Do you have ADD or are you... Are you a little OCD? So I'm going to ask you, did your mom ever tell you when you're a little Mark, you're just, you're just ADD. You're, you're too anal. I mean, did you, you said you have pictures of these drawers and check them every hour. You, you really think that detail of attention is, is, is necessary and a good thing? Yeah, I think it's a great thing and it sounds ridiculously over the top, but if you have protocol sheets in every room, so every time we turn a room on that protocol sheet is, you know, drawer is checked and stocked according to, you know, ideal picture, you know, and then you go through a checklist every single time we turn the room, they have to sign and physically check off on this piece of paper and a dry erase marker. And that is on the countertop every time the doctor walks into the room, you know, so it wow. sounds extremely anal, but holy cow, do you get consistency? And if I'm going to have 25, um, Every six months, 25 new dental assisting students stocking my room and walking patients back to the operatory. Darn it, they don't have any dental experience. It needs to be as turnkey as possible. So they know that they have these three checklists that they have to check off every single thing. And I feel comfortable having a student who's never stepped foot in a dental office before bring my patient back the right way, seat them. And I know that when I walk into the room, I have the right burst set up, I have the right tray. And every, you know, the, the base of the chair and the rear stand was dusted because that's all on a checklist. I want, I want to tell you a, a first, an old story on Dentaltown and have you comment on it. There was a uh, gentleman who wrote an article on Dentaltown in a post. He says, I do my root canals in 15 minutes, my molar root canals. And everybody said, oh my God, you're a hack. You're horrible. You're horrible. So me and a bunch of other townies like Jerome Smith, we actually flew to Scott's office in Houston. And what was amazing is how I learned that, yeah, you spend an hour doing a root canal because you waste 45 minutes of the hour. Like, 
Like you would get done with a slow speed and you would make the hatchet and take out the file and put it in here and then look for your next file. But he had three slow speeds there and his assistants were doing that while he was using the first one. And it made me realize that when you go watch other dentists, I mean, any of my friends that I go watch them in their dental office, they can't do a single procedure where the dental assistant has to get up and leave the room to go find something three times during a crown or a filling. And I'm just like, how, how did you not know during the root canal you'd need an apex locator? How come when you asked for this <laughs> instrument, she had to get up and leave the room? I mean, so, so what you're saying, so, so I'm gonna ask you this, is it a litmus test? Is it a fair test to go in there and tell your staff on Monday morning, hey, when, we, when you bring me in the room to do an MOD direct composite on number three, the minute we go, no one leaves the room. Because when I was uh, when I was a little young and more of a hothead, I always had these fantasies. I wanted to get go get one of those blow horns, you know. <laughs> and every time the assistant leave the room, I wanted to push this blow horn so the the office manager had to come to the room so I could just say, "Why the hell does she have to leave? All I asked for was a Toffelmeyer matrix, and she left the room." I mean, you know, because it just drove me crazy. Because I always feel sorry for the patient having to sit in there for an hour or two or three hours for something that should have taken, you know, a third of that time. But, but, but back to the question, is it a fair litmus test to say, when I sit down to do an MOD or a crown, you should never have to leave the room. Is that, is that fair or is that too anal or I too think hard? It's totally fair, but I would add something to that. I w what I do when we work with offices, and this is what I did in the beginning, you have to remember I had, for the very first time that I had four practices at once, it was chaos for me because I had none of these systems in place. And I, I wasn't able to train every single person exactly the way that I wanted them to. So people were running around and, and, and wait times were an hour, just like you said. I would, first things first, I would say, hey, here's four blank pieces of paper. I want you to write down exactly what you do during a composite filling and write down everything that you need for that. And then do that for a crown, do that for a root canal, do that for a denture, do that for a partial. And then they take ownership over it. You know, and then you can create a protocol sheet and actually take a picture based on their ideal setup. So when you walk in the next Monday morning after you had them put this protocol sheet and picture together, if it's not right, you can look back at them and say, look, you created this protocol. This is exactly the way you wanted it. So you got to own this. So sign this accountability agreement and say you'll never miss one of these again. And we'll have to counsel you in case you do. Okay, I I'm, think that's I'm, totally fair. I think that's fair. Okay, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stand up for the the dental assistant and go against you. Okay, please. The dental assistant listens to this podcast saying, "Mark, you're crazy because there's two dentists in here, and and you need different gloves, and you use Healy Muller, and you use Tetrix Ceram, and we have two hygienists in here, and I, I can't have I can't assist." two different hygienists and two different dentists in one dental office when every one of you needs different gloves, supplies, composites, bonding agents. I mean, is it fair for the dental assistant to say, hey, Mark, your associate, two hygienists, you all agree on one bonding agent, one composite, one glove, and, and is that fair for the assistant to say? I think it's very fair, and it's a great point. And right from the beginning, when I started having multiple practices, I decided that all of the associates would use the same thing that I decided was be the best for the practice. We watch our overhead so carefully that I can't have everybody using di di different, different materials for every procedure. So in my office, everybody uses the same thing. And if there needs to be a compromise, we make a compromise and we decide on one thing. The one area where that differs is the birds and I allow our associates to have whatever type of birds they want but there's a different picture for my burr setup versus the associates burr setup and they know that if they're assisting Dr. Um, Darren at one point then he's got a different burr setup than mine everything else is the same but it, it's not impossible to do even if you have different material different setups different preferences as long as you have pictures of it it's really, really simple. It all takes place in the supply room and, and uh, they bring it out the right way. So, so why did you, why did you um, break protocol with burrs and not bonding agents and composites and all? Well, burrs for me, I'm, I'm, I'm really particular about burrs, so maybe I was biased. And uh, I, I only use three 
diamond burrs, you know, I have a football diamond, I have a chamfer, and then I have a flame where I break contact. That's all I use. And I get that, you know, certain dentists want different, you know, um, end cutting burrs and, and that sort of thing. So I use a seven iron as if I'm playing golf. I use like three things. My, my golf bag would be the simple, simplest golf bag ever. I use like three things and my oral surgery setup's the same way. So as far as burrs go, if they want different types of burrs, I'm, I'm totally cool with that. Okay. And it's, it's a pretty low, low ticket item as well. Okay, Mark, I want to, um, I, I want to really focus on something that you're uh, a master at and that is overhead. And most dentists um, are very confused when they work hard all day long and they go home tired every single day. And then at the end of the month, they find out there's hardly any money left over. So okay. I want you to start with um, what should, what, what would you say um, the average overhead is and what could you aim for and go through like what, you know, let's talk overhead. From what I've heard, the average overhead for American dentists is between 60 and 72%. Okay. If you're going to follow my formula, if your overhead is up to 70% and you're paying yourself 30%, which is what I think fair compensation for an owner should be, then you have zero profit. Okay. That means that overhead 70%, you're paying yourself 30. There's nothing left after you pay yourself a fair wage. All right. Our overheads in our offices and, and with most of my clients range anywhere from 48% to 56, 58%. I think that anybody could get their overhead under 55%. Now that, that varies greatly depending on obviously location and Beverly Hills rent is going to be a lot more than Chino Valley rent where there's more horses in town than there are people, but you can make up for that in other areas. So if I was going to give some tips on overhead, the first thing that I would focus on for a dentist would be to focus on all areas that are non-payroll related overhead items. And the two biggest always are lab fees and materials, you know, consumables. If you can control those, you'd be surprised how out of crazy whack so many dentists get with their material bill and their lab fee. And it's completely, completely controllable. So if I see somebody over, and this is so common, Howard, I can't even tell you. If I see somebody over three and a half to four percent on dental consumables every month, if that's a hundred thousand dollar a month practice, that's four grand right there that they're not paying themselves. They're actually helping put their, you know, their reps kids through college instead of their own, you know. And if if the same thing for for lab fees, if it's nine percent, I consistently see people eleven to fifteen percent of their overall. So if they're four to five percent. That's another five grand. So a lot of times I look like a hero because I say, hey, look, you don't have to use this lab necessarily, and you can use this lab for these certain types of procedures, and you don't have to use this gigantic clearinghouse for all of your supplies. You can join a buying group like we have, and you can save 30% starting Okay, tomorrow. okay, let, let's get, let's get, um, I'm going to nail you down for specifics. So what do you think supplies should be, and what do you think labs should be? I like supplies under 5%. I like lab between eight and a half and nine percent. Okay, so the first thing this podcast first is listening on a lab supply eight to nine percent. Are you doing your crowns yourself with a CAD CAM, or are you sending it to a lab? It's a great question. I use a traditional lab. Okay, and, and, and I don't, I don't have any. Uh, I use uh, impression material. I'm still doing the old fashioned way. I don't have a. Uh, so any so your so your lab bill is eight to nine percent a month. Yeah. And your and your supplies is three and a half percent or three and a half to five percent. Four to five percent. I would four, say. four to five percent. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. how does a dentist um, get their supply? How how do you keep your lab eight to nine and your supplies four to five? Specifics. Well, specifics. First of all, I make sure that I'm not paying more than one hundred and twenty dollars per single unit of crown and bridge. My crown and bridge actually averages between seventy and eighty dollars for zirconia. Emacs, and there's plenty of great labs, United States labs, with good techs that do a zirconia crown for under eighty bucks. Okay, let's uh, let's uh, give uh, names. The lab that I use is Jet Lab. Jet. Jet J J E T L A B. Uh, the owner of that is Ray Coleman. Is that JetLab.com? Uh, JetLabServices.com. JetLabServices.com. Where's that at? He's in Utah. Utah? 
Yeah, I don't know uh, the city in Utah, but uh, I send all of my Crown of Bridge to Utah. And who's the owner there? Uh, his name is Ray Coleman, Dr. Ray Coleman. He's a dentist. He's a practicing dentist, actually. Really? He's a practicing dentist and he owns a lab? Yeah. Is it yeah. a big lab or is it a small? No, it's, it's kind of a small lab, but he's really good. His ceramics and... So uh, do, you, do you just really use good. one lab? I use one lab. I use another lab um, called Encore Lab. They're a little bit pricier, but they have sometimes a half a week faster turnaround time. So if I have somebody that's got to get out of town, I'll use them. And they're Encore Dental Lab. E N C O R E Dental Lab. Yep, and they're also in Utah. Um, I don't, I don't have the owner's name off the top of my head, but they're, they're good as well. Mm -hmm. But these are all labs that you can get your. But what your, do you pay? Uh, I think 100. the better question than the lab might be, what are you paying a unit on these so they can see if their labs paying that? I pay seventy-seven dollars for zirconia. Emax is eighty-four, I believe. And then uh, I, I don't do a whole lot of uh, PFM, but the PFMs are about 60 bucks. Okay. And yeah. so, um, and what about supplies? Supplies are something right, that right, I you buy with. through Patterson, Shine, Benko, Burkhart. I For the longest time, I used only Shine. And I do like, I like Sullivan Shine. I like a lot what they do. And I really love my, my, my rep. And he's been with me since I opened my very first dental practice. And I was always hitting the supply, you know, budget, sometimes over by a half, sometimes over by a percent. But I've always, from the very beginning, watched that very closely. I found one time when I, I thought I was paying too much for my gloves, I switched gloves from this buying group that I had found through one of my clients. I saved $800 the first month on gloves alone. And then I started sending more of my invoices to this buying club. I ended up saving 30%. We saved $2,700 the first full month that we used this buying club. Now, I still use Sull Sullivan Shine for a lot of stuff, but I sent all of my invoices to this buying group. This buying group tells me what they can beat as far as price-wise and what they can't. And if there's substitutions, I'll try the substitution for a month. And what, what, is like it, what is this buying club? What's the name of it? It's called this, – this one's called Synergy Dental Partners, and it's uh, Rick – Ofit is the owner. He's a doctor as well. And this is all dentists that own this. Okay, line. wait. Synergy Dental Partners. Synergy Dental Partners. Yep. Dot com. Uh, I don't know what they're. I'm sorry. I don't have their, And, and, don't have, and you're it's, saying it's a uh, it's owned by a dentist? Yeah, it's all dentists. And where's um, uh where's where's this, what's the dentist's name? Dr. Richard Ofut. O F F U T T. I have his phone number. Where where's he out of? Uh, he's on the East Coast somewhere. Seven oh four area code, if you know what that is. Okay, seven oh four. Six oh nine. Six oh nine. Eight nine three nine. Eight nine three nine. And so you that so do you what you buy almost everything through the Synergy Dental Partners? Yeah, I mean, I would say probably about thirty to forty percent. I still get from Sullivan and Shine because I have, I get a multiple practice discount from them. But anything that I buy through them, I send the invoice to to Synergy. And if they can beat it, they beat it. And the reason they're able to do that is because we have this volume discount that comes in um, from a bunch of different dentists, just like you and me, that, that uh, come in through this buying club. And uh, they have special deals for recruitment from these, from these different clearinghouses. So, so do you also buy um, 30% you know, or whatever from uh, Sullivan Shine because you want the repairman relationship, the maintenance relationship too? or? No, it's because they they actually have the lowest price on those items because okay. I get a, a special deal for multiple practices. But I, it is nice to have. So then you're you're going where where price is king. I mean, you're you're not you're going to buy at Costco if that's cheaper than Kroger. Absolutely, but I always do check to make sure. You know, there's there's bonding agents that I've tried that that were just crap. There's there's cement that I've tried that just weren't good. Um, I have my favorite brand still. But I, you know, once I get my favorite brand, I still want the best price for it. I don't think people realize that, you know, a, a certain rep will walk into a business with 18 dentists and the guy they play golf with, you know, will have a totally different price than the guy on the third floor whose office manager never lets them talk to the doctor. You know, it's, it's crazy how much profitability margin there is and how much fudge factor there is in there and uh, how much you, they can actually work with price. And I, you know, if, if my rep is listening, I'm sorry, but um, 
you know, the reality is there's a lot of profitability hidden. Well, in you know companies. what the grand earthquake was in all this is, you know, the, in America, the largest distributor is Walmart. Number two is Costco. Number three is Kroger and, and Kroger or grocery store change, but Kroger, um, they don't change the name to Kroger. So like in Arizona, it's Fry's and Kansas is Dillon's, you know, uh, but number four is Amazon and Amazon uh, just signed up um, to the Dental Trade Manufacturers Association. They're joining and those people are saying that um, Amazon Prime is going to get into the dental supply business. Oh and and it, it was an earthquake because uh, there's the, everybody is like, you know, because I mean, imagine you're a dental supply house. And Jeff Bezos doing 90 billion a year says, wow, your margins are very high. I, I want a piece of that. Yeah. And uh, that, that's going to be a total game changer. In fact, oh. I want to go to the next uh, Dental Trade Manufacturer Association meeting just to see what their strategy is. But could you imagine uh, going to bed one day knowing you're a millionaire? The next day, uh, Jeff Bezos of Amazon is going to be competing against you? That's crazy. It's yeah. Crazy. The bottom line is, though, Howard, if you think about the benefit that corporate has over us, right? First of all, they, they understand how to keep overhead low, which is huge. They have relationships with the big clearing houses usually, or they own their own supply company, right? And then they have these sweetheart deals with, with these huge labs where um, their shipping is usually free and they get, you know, 30 to 40% off retail what us dentists are paying for. If you could create a corporate environment within your small one doctor, two doctor dental office, you could get all the benefits of corporate and then you learn how to, to run your practice efficiently with an operations manual, which is what these CEOs are getting paid, you know, $350,000 for, uh, uh, it's sometimes up to a million dollars for these corporate, you know, for these corporate chains. If you could figure that out, you could get all the benefits of corporate without having to sell your soul. So we just, we're coming up on 200,000 townies. We're at like 198,600 and we're just shy of 4 million posts. Um, you've been in townie for a long time. Um, would you ever start a thread and post that manual so that uh, oh, the, yeah. the, the, all these townies listening could uh, find it on Dental Town and then everybody could uh, discuss it? Yeah, could, maybe you, that could, was... you, could you make your inaugural virgin post? <laughs> yeah, maybe that would be a great way to start. You know, uh, my, my first thread would be just to post the, uh, the operations manual out there. I think I, that would I, be great. And, and, and also, then... and also, we. Um, we have put up 307 um, one-hour courses, and they just passed 500,000 views because a lot of overhead people don't want to close down their dental office to go to a course. But I would, I would just give anything if you would uh, do an online CE course or even a series uh, because you're just uh, – I've been to your seminars. So you're, you're an amazing instructor. Well, thank you. You're, you're an amazing teacher. Would you ever consider would... making an online CE course too? Totally. I would love to work with Howard, Howard Goldstein. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Yeah. But, but I, I want to, I want to challenge something you just said. Um, you said, you know, to get overhead, um, the, the ADA says overhead average on their last survey was 64%. You said 60 to 72%. So that's right in the range. And you said you can get down to 48 to 58 and that, and that you should focus on lab and supplies. But I just, my, my, my job is to guess what these individual dentists are thinking when they're driving in their car to work listening to these hour commutes and they're yeah. thinking they're thinking mark dude when i get done paying payroll i don't care what the light bill is i don't, I don't care how much i pay for gauze i mean i i sometimes i can't make payroll sometimes i have to delay payroll for two days so so talk about payroll what what if what if this dentist is um um thinking that, um her payroll's too high what should payroll be do you just have one number for the whole staff or do you break it from front office to dental assistants, the hygienist and the million dollar question, how do you pay your hygienist? Is that an hourly thing, a production, a percentage and, and your associate, do you pay them a wage or a percentage? So, so talk about labor, which is the biggest expense. Yeah. So overall, I say 30% 30, 30 is acceptable for payroll. Okay. 30%. 30% total. I think now does that, include look, the, does that include the associate dentist? That does not include the associate dentist, but it does include hygiene. And if you're going to break that down, specifically hygiene should be about 9%. So if you're looking at, I have, I have my little chart here, staff salary, non-hygienist, non-associate, about 16%, hygiene, 9%, payroll taxes, about 25 
fringe benefits about two and a half. So add all those up together, you get about 30%. Okay, tell, t t you said uh, tax suit, yeah, that's uh, FICA matching, the, the yeah. payroll taxes. Yep. And then you said, what was the other one? You said benefits, two uh, and a half percent. Fringe Fr benefits, two and a half percent. That might be on the low end. But what, that's what, what is a fringe benefit? I would, I would consider that, like for, for my office, whatever percentage you pay for medical insurance and then a 401k match, perhaps about two and a half percent of total payroll. So you, do you provide medical insurance and, um, and 401k? We pay 50% of medical insurance benefit if they choose to, to accept the plan. And then we give a 3% match on 401k. That's exactly what I do. And the reason I did that is because so many uh, of my staff the last 28 years, when I paid for the whole medical, I'd say, well, you know, I, I pay your medical. And they'd always say, well, I don't care. My husband has medical. Exactly. And I exactly. thought, well, if you don't care, then let's cancel the plan. Oh, no, I want it anyway. And then when yeah. I went to, okay, I'll pay half, um, everybody who had a domestic partner uh, and wanted their medical because they worked at some bigger company or government or whatever, they, they dropped out of it. So, so yeah, right. I, think, I think they should have some skin in the game. And we do the 401k matching up to 3% too. So, and so, I, had, I had to say, I don't think people really realize the benefit of the 3% the match. I think they would, whatever that 2.5% is, I think they'd rather have a dollar raise or an extra bump at the end. But I'm doing this for their benefit. I know it sounds condescending, but oh, no. I, I, don't, I don't think people realize the value of a 3% match and stocking money away that you never see uh, and, and the tax benefits of it. And I, I'm just doing that because I think that's the right thing to do. Um, they would rather have a two dollar rate, but that that's just going to get pissed away anyway. And, and, I, and I want to I want to throw my fellow dentist under the bus because uh, I, I'm not here to be your friend. I I, I I've always um I've always been politically incorrect because I think so many politicians and people are lying to you, um, telling you what you want to hear. And I think when someone tells you what they actually think, I'm old school. I, I think that means I'm your friend. I think I, I think your mom or your dad or your brother or your best friend tell you what you don't want to hear. And I just see so many dentists talking about, you know, uh, they're conservative and this and that and this and that, and they're against Obamacare and they're against every, every government handout helper thing there is mm -hmm. and say, okay, so then you're free enterprise. So then you're going to do that. Right. And they don't have health insurance. They don't have a right. retirement plan. They don't do anything. And I'm like, buddy, someone's going to do it. The government's going to do it or you're going to do it. So don't say that you're conservative and the government should stay out of it and then don't do it for your own. And I can't believe how many consultants out there um, who think they're uh, holier than thou and, and all this stuff and telling people do not provide medical, no 401k, no retirement, no ever. And it's the same one on Facebook posting anti-Obama and anti-government. So, so someone's, someone's got to help these people. And you're right. I, I have grinned several times because uh, I got staff that's been with me 28 years. I got, and, uh, and th those retirement accounts are getting huge. And going back over those 28 years, when they stumbled with the divorce or something with their housing, and they came to me and they wanted to cash it out, and I'm, I just fought it tooth and nail. I said, right now you can get a job. Right now you can get a part-time job at McDonald's or Walgreens or Walmart. But there's gonna come a day when you can't do anything. There's gonna come a day when you've had two new hips and two new knees, and you're sitting on the couch swollen, and, and you're gonna be saying, I'm lucky I worked for Howie because he did this 401k and yeah, so I, I, I get great satisfaction of knowing that it was right in the long run. I so, so, agree more. So, agree so, more. so basically um, after labor lab and supplies, is there anything else you should focus on on overhead or is that? You got, you got office expenses, which is about 1.2, 1.5%, which is, you know, your paper clips and, and your ink for in your paper and, and all of that sort of thing. It's probably going to be lower if there's if there's a, a paperless practice. That's an insignificant amount. Another biggie is facility, about nine percent, and that's going to vary hugely. So there's certain things that you can control. When I say control non-payroll overhead first, that's because I try to get my clients to make their dental teams the highest paid in the area. And what I usually that's not by base pay, that's by incentive pay. And we base all of our incentives, whether that's that that's uh, for the hygiene hygiene program or the rest of the staff. We we always base incentives around overhead. So they get two percent of collections if their overhead is between forty eight and fifty three percent. And they get, I'm sorry, yeah, two percent. And then anything under fifty three to fifty nine percent, they get one percent of total collections. 
And by God, Howard, you would have no idea how tight we run that ship because they won't put an extra two by two on the, on the tray. They, their, their floss is usually too short because they are so, you know, I used to have, you know, my, my, my contact paper is teeny now, you know, it, it, I used to have two triangles on every tray. Now they put one or, and then, and then they put like a jar on the countertop because they said most times you don't even use a triangle. So they're watching every single expenditure in the office because they don't get that, they don't get that incentive unless the overhead hits the right number. So I would gladly give two or three percent of my my uh, my total profit to them if I knew that I was still going to be profiting under, you know, 45, 50 percent, or if I was going to be taking home 45, 50 percent. Would you um, post that bonus system on Dentaltown too? Oh, sure. Which sure, I think that sure. should be, you know, a practice management. We have 51 forums, you know, root canals, fillings, crowns. Practice management, uh, that, uh, that'd that be amazing. I think it's almost too thread. Or, or would you put that on your on your thread where you start the uh, office yeah. manual, or would that be yeah. a separate thread on the bonus system? You know, it's funny. I was listening to you uh, talk to Jim or Tim, I, the guy that had 22,000 posts on, on Dentaltown. I was so impressed that he had so many. And you were talking about, hey, what do you suggest you do if, if you've just been shy about posting in the past? And I think I'm one of those lurkers that you guys were talking about that just wasn't sure if there was anything valuable that I was saying. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, you've given me so much uh, ammo to put out there. I think that, I think that it, I'd be happy to start a thread now. Yeah. That would be, uh, that would be so amazing. Um, I, I want to I go back to um, stress for these dentists. A lot of dentists, they, they sit there and they're, they're looking at you and you're, you're a pretty boy in a suit and tie and you're, you're all that. And they're sitting there thinking, Mark, I, I, I almost get nauseous if I thought I had to go in and talk to my hygienist. Uh, my, my, my hygienist uh, came in and asked me for a raise and I, I wanted to just puke in the trash can. And, and I, I'm, um, what would you say to a dentist who says, um, you know, I just want to go in my private office and shut the door. And you're, you're out there and, and you're selling, you know, a bonus system and you're leading them all. And I'm just not a leader. And, and what advice would you give for me if I'm not a leader and I own my small business and how am I going to do all this? So, so the question is, would you just say, okay, dude, you, you need an office manager. If you can't do it, get it. Do you use an office manager? I do. I use an office manager. Well, we have office supervisors and then we have an overall oper operations manager manager for all of the practices. But I would say, back to your point, I would say, hey, look, my favorite quote in the world is, your level of success is directly dependent on the number of uncomfortable conversations you're willing to have. So dentists, doctors out there, if you're unwilling to have uncomfortable conversations, you will never be successful. So this is my tough love part of, of, of my talk with my clients. Look. You are telling yourself in your head that you're not a good leader. You are also telling yourself when you say that, that you are never going to rise in success beyond the level that you are at right now. So whatever it is that's going to get you to have uncomfortable conversations, you know, the, the, the top 1% of the dental profession didn't just get there because they hid in their office. If that's what you want, you have to go out there and get it. And the first thing you have to learn how to do is have uncomfortable conversations. You, that is the one thing I don't think you can delegate 100% to an operations manager or a supervisor or, or an office manager. You've got to grow some you-know-whats and get out there and have those difficult conversations. If you can't do that, I'm sorry. Now, there are some resources where you can actually work on that. I have dentists that I, I could not get them out of their shell. They joined Toastmasters. I have dentists that... One of my favorite books is John Maxwell's, you know, 21 Irrefut Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. You can listen and watch to so many great resources on YouTube. Just look up leadership. I watch a TED Talk every single day when I'm working out. And I, I'm always constantly trolling YouTube for inspiration and, um, and better tactics for leadership. I was not born a natural leader. I was, you know, I was a kid with ADD. That, that was an average student at best. The only thing I was good at was sports, but I just got over it. You know, one of the most horrific things in the world that I could have imagined in my, in my past history was getting up and talking in front of people. Now I do that for a living. So 
it's just a matter of getting out there out of your comfort zone and knowing that you're going to have to have those conversations. Well, that's why you need to do an online CE course because there's about 240 different um, um, dental organization speakers and most of them are nonprofits and they'll go into a room and they'll say, okay, uh, we need volunteers to pick the speakers for next year's convention and three introvert shy dentists raise their hand. And this is what they say to them. Uh, give us someone on uh, endo and implants. And then the number one complaint of every um, convention ever given is there's nothing for the staff. So they always have to have a practice management and don't get the one we had last year, or the year before, get someone new. So these dentists don't know what to do. So they'll go to the online CE and they'll go to like, say you had to pick the endo speaker. And there's like eight one hour courses by eight different guys. And they'll listen to eight guys. It's kind of like their demo. I had, I had one guy put up a one hour course and he got booked for 76 in, in invitationals from here to Kathmandu in one year because that, that wow. that's your that's your demo. So uh, so if you're demo. listening to this, I've already heard Mark. I've heard him in Scottsdale. Uh, I, I know this guy. If, if you're looking for a speaker in practice management, um, this is your man. But go back and, and finish. Um, how do you pay your hygienist and your associate dentist? Great question. Okay, so hygiene. hygiene is a typical, you know, 40 to $48 an hour, depending on the hygienist and depending how long they've been working. My, the, the, the most inexperienced hygienist that I have makes $40 an hour all the way up to 48. And my, my, once again, there's always an incentive for them. Okay. So their baseline goal for the day, we always have production goals, but the hygiene baseline production is three times their hourly salary. So if they're working eight hours a day, and they're making $40 an hour, that'd be $120 times eight. So what is that, 960 bucks or something like that? That's, their, that's the minimum amount of production that we expect from them. Any number above that, they get 15% of that. So if, if it's 960 bucks and they produce 2,000, which is usually around where mine come in, 1,600 to 2,000, then they'll get you know $1,000 times 15, they'll get an extra 150 bucks for that day. We do a single day and then we close it out. And then they get paid a collective bonus at the end of a two week period, first to 15. That's hygiene. My that's, a, that's intense. I, I'd say the average hygienist doesn't even do a thousand a day. My, my hygienists do between 1,600 and 2,200. 2, so so, so why, do you, why do you think the average hygienist, because the dentist is trying to do the math on his head, the average hygienist does a thousand a day. How do you get yours doing 1,600 to 2,000? It wasn't always like that. I think before our incentive program, they probably averaged about 800 to 1,000. Um, but when we got the incentive program in place and we gave them some tools to increase the revenue in the hygiene department, I think that it just really, really took off. And another thing is that you don't have to over-diagnose to be a really profitable hygiene department. You just have to give the hygiene department some adjunct areas that they can they can increase their, their revenue. So obviously adult sealants, we've all heard that. Um, adult fluoride is a really big one. I see a ton of people with xerostomia because we have an aged population here and they get root caries. And those people, it's almost mandatory in our office that those people, every time they come in, if it's a three, four month uh, recall, they're always getting adult fluoride. Um, you know, you can also sell, you know, you can sell physical products. You can sell, you know, spin brushes and you can sell, um, chlorhexidine and whatnot, any little thing that you can, you know, desensitizing agents, um, anything that you can use to increase the revenue per hour. So we know the, the person that's scheduling the appointment, the hygiene coordinator and the hygienist know that somehow $120 has to come out of that operatory for that hour that she's working. And they do everything they can to make sure that they hit that number. 120 an hour. 120 an hour. If she's making 40 bucks an hour. If it's, she's making 50 an hour, then it needs to be 150 per hour. Okay. So, I mean, I, I have no problem paying somebody 45, 50 bucks an hour as long as they can maintain that, that baseline for me. Then, which, which is times three their labor? Yeah. So, for three. every dollar you pay them times three, you need to, to gross at the door. And what about your dentist? My dentist is a straight 30% minus 30% lab fees. They eat what they kill. There's no guarantee. So, they get 30%. And I take 30% of their lab fee off of the production and they get for because I, you know, we have 199 to 100% collection percentage. So we, I, I see no point in paying them on collection. Um, I know that my billing department is tight, so we pay them on production. We might lose a half percent percent here or there, but, but uh, they're happy, man. I'm, we, we're, we're getting, you know, 
80 to 110 new patients per practice. So there's plenty for everybody to do. And how are you getting 80 to 110 new patients? What, what, what is your market? How are you getting these people to the door? Is it just good demographics, good location, good visibility? Or are you a, a master at marketing? Well, I, I wouldn't call myself a master. In, in all fairness, I have to say that my demographics are favorable for sure. Um, but I'll say to that, you were born in San Diego. It's not like you tripped and fell and landed in Prescott. That's right. You, that's you, right. you went out and found where you wanted to create a supply where they were needed, where most dentists just say, well, I want to, um, I just want to, uh, you know, have a dental office that looks out over the ocean and I want to leave, live in Newport beach. And they don't take into consideration where, well, maybe there's only 300 people for every dentist in Newport beach, but if you want an hour inland, uh, to Palmdale, maybe they need you in Palmdale or Bakersfield. So a lot of dentists, it's like a lot of people tell me and Phoenix just gripes me where they say, well, you got lucky. You, you set up an all with in 1987. I'm like, dude, I was born in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, just, how, I just, that was not luck. That was yeah. I didn't, I didn't have my go-kart breakdown and then to get stuck <laughs> in, you know, 1100 miles away. I mean, I found it and I moved there and it was a great sacrifice to move away from my best friend and idol and role model father but I just thought there wasn't an, an nearly any opportunity in Wichita because the population had been the same for 20 years because every time a girl got pregnant, a guy left town. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to go to the town everybody was going to, which was exploding Phoenix, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So you and I did not get lucky on demographic. You and I went in search of demographics and we went where they needed a dentist. I would say that a lot of that was research based. Yeah. That, that was intentional. Um, but uh, here's, here's my take on marketing, Howard. What works in Ahwatukee is not going to work in Prescott for sure, right? It all comes down to calculating ROI on anything that you try. In some markets, radio is the best way. You, nobody listens to the radio up here. That would never work. In my, in my market, print media works very, very well. Coupons that they cut out of the sports page, <laughs> that's what works in my area. That, would, that probably wouldn't work in Ahwatukee, but it works really well here. The only way I know that is because every single thing that I put out into the universe, I tracked what came back in and I calculated ROI for every dollar that went out. I wanted a three to one ROI for everything. And if it wasn't, you know, my billboard pulls three to one. Is that three to one, three to one gross sales or, or net income profit? You're talking about gross, 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 gross. sales. So, yeah, so yeah. if you put a dollar on a billboard, you want to get $3 back that month or you're going to pull the billboard. That's right. And That's your right. billboard is a return on investment up in Prescott? Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I wanted so badly to get um, up in, in Chino Valley. I wanted to get on the highway. But at the time, I couldn't afford a building right on the highway. So my my compromise was to get a building, a, a block off the highway. And it was a standalone, nice 2,000 square foot building. But then I, I, I calculated that I could afford this billboard by getting a block in. And it's worked really well, really well. We well, should do an cars. experiment on that billboard. And we should take your face off it and put on mine and see <laughs> see if that would make you have to see what that would do to the return on the billboard. I wonder if you'd have to pull the billboard ad uh, <laughs> after the first month. Uh, so um, I only I only got you for two minutes. Um, so I, I got two more questions. Um, number one, tell us um, about that dental assisting school and how they can find out more about that. And tell them uh, in a big close, um, how could... I, how could this dentist listening to a podcast get you, Mark, the man, cost us to help them individually? The best way to get in touch with me, thank you so much, Howard. The best way to get in touch with me is just to email me directly at info at truedentalsuccess.com. If you go to truedentalsuccess.com, which is the main website there, just type in your email address and I'll shoot you out a free book and a free video called Cracking the Top 1%, which is one of my keynote speakers, I think probably from the event that you are at. Howard, when, when you spoke uh, so graciously and so awesomely at, at my first event. Um, so they'll get a keynote video and they'll get a free book. And then with that, we can set up a free consultation and I'll, I'll analyze all their numbers. And I'll be able to. I'll be now, able to. now, is that video on YouTube? Yeah. Because yeah. when you make a post on dentistry, we have a YouTube button. So if you go to your YouTube and then click share and go and click embed, you can cut and paste that, drop it in the deal. And that whole video is right on your thread. So they could watch a keynote right. speaker because that is an amazing lecture you gave. And uh, um, I really like that. And, and so, but you have, I, I, you, but you have true dental success.com, but you have horizon DDS.com. Horizon DDS.com is my, is my practice website. And then I have 
teachdentalassistance.com. So teachdentalassistance.com. That's if they're interested in the dental assisting school. Okay, so and uh, we're, we're in overtime now. So just real quick, um, what, what's the story on the dental assisting school? And, and what, what uh, t- tell us about that for a minute. I'll tell you straight up, it's, it's the ability to, to monetize your building, your practice, your physical facility when the practice is closed. Okay, so you imagine you go home at five o'clock. If you had another business that opened at five o'clock once you went home, that's what the dental assisting school is. And I know a lot, a lot of dentists are thinking, well, geez, I don't want to sit there and teach a bunch of rookies how to, to suck spit. The bottom line is we have our, our the staff, and it's completely turnkey. The staff runs a school in your reception area and then has a lab in your operatories from probably five o'clock to eight o'clock at night, two times per week or on the weekends, and you can learn how to repurpose your facility when it's closed anyway. Um, and and how, how much does the uh, you charge to become a dental assistant? How long is the program? The program is 13 weeks. I charge $3,000 per student. We average between 10 and 12 students four times per year. And we did the, obviously this is mine. It's been there for a while. Um, but the overheads between 15 and 18 percent, which is sweet compared to dentistry, obviously. You know what business I did? What's that? To repurpose my office. You know, I'm Breaking Bad. How he um, started making meth. <laughs> what we do yeah. is we take the Novocaine and convert it to pure cocaine, and then sell it at the back door of the office after hours. Oh, nice. That's that's yeah. a good. That's, and, that's and we just good. had to hire one chemist, and. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We live in the country of Sheriff Joe. I'd, I'd, I'd be shot in Tent City if that happened. But hey, Mark, um, love you to death. You're a class act. I like everything you're doing for dentistry. Why a lot of people are thinking we're losing the corporate dentistry. You're just crushing it on so many levels. You're just smart. You're intelligent. Uh, you're in my backyard. Everybody I know loves you. Um, I hope to see your first inaugural post on Dental Town. Uh, love it if you put on an online CE course. And buddy, seriously, on behalf of... Uh, um, dentistry, thank you so much for everything that you do for dentistry. Right back at you, Howard. I'm so happy to be friends with you. All right, buddy. We'll see you around. Take care. Talk All right, soon. bye-bye.